Good Saturday morning. It's time for devotions. Um, you, you may notice a few things. Number one, uh, I did get a haircut. And I want you to know I was well within the realm of what's uh, legitimate, legal, and appropriate. My wife cut my hair. So it, uh, uh, she had been threatening to do it for some time. And I kept saying, well, you just say, say the, the moment and I'll, you know, it's not, it's not like our... Our lives are, are constrained by too rigorous a schedule. We manage to stay quite busy, but the schedule is not so much it. And she finally uh, followed through. So uh, I am feeling uh, less hairy and uh, and certainly uh, <laughs> a little cooler as, as we continue on weather appropriate for Hawaiian shirts. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, and... Uh, turn to the Lord in prayer and then we'll finish off with some announcements uh, today will you join with me Almighty God you have called the church into being and have gathered us into one family by the power of your Holy Spirit help us to live in unity and peace with all of your children may our actions this day be fruit of your faith the faith that you give us to live in your kingdom. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, today's scripture is coming from the book of Colossians, and uh, that's going to be chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. And uh, so Colossians 3, 5 through 17. There's an old story uh, about a new pastor who uh, goes to this church uh, out in the in the the boonies and uh and he is a little nervous because you know it's kind of his his first time and and uh so he's uh he's there preaching and he notices one elderly woman in the back of the church and she is just really into it and uh and he preaches about the evils of uh uh of uh television for example and she was back there yelling preach it preach it and uh, then he talked about uh, the evils of alcohol, and she was back there yelling, preach it, preach it. Then he went through a whole list of sins, and finally he began to talk about the sin of chewing tobacco. And at that point, uh, she yelled from the back, preacher, you done quit preaching and you gone to meddling. And so we're going to meddle a little this morning. Um, it, uh, it This passage has a, a, a lot of... Uh, commentaries about do not do this do not do that and uh, those are good things for us to hear once in a while to kind of be reminded okay so Paul writes put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality impurity lust evil desires and greed which is idolatry now we're going to come back and talk about that that comment about idolatry okay so uh, kind of highlight that in your in your mental memory there because of these the wrath of God is coming you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these anger rage malice slander and filthy language from your lips do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another forgive as the lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity let the peace of christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing songs or psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. 
And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Now what you have here is you have a kind of a comparison contrast passage. Um, he starts out talking about uh, things that you should not do. And then he talks about the things that you want to do. And, and in reality, what he does is he says, don't do these things because you become these things. And, uh, and do these things because then you will become these things. And, and so it's, uh, it, it really uh, it strikes me recently how much of uh, uh, when we translate from do into be, we become much, much closer to the heart of the issue and we become much, much closer to God's heart. So let's start and kind of work our way down through this a little bit. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, I doubt there's too many of us who would not look at these things and say, yeah, those are wrong, you know? Um, sexual immorality, okay, wrong. Uh, impurity, okay, yeah, wrong. Lust, yeah. Evil desires, well, I, obviously, if it starts with evil, it's probably not going to be good, you know. Uh, and then, um, you know, it, it he goes on um, with a whole nother list. He says, uh, you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And you're going, yeah, I probably, those are probably wrong, too. And you know that they're wrong. But what what Paul does is he puts it into a, he takes these things that we know are wrong and then he puts it into a category. And the category is idolatry. And uh, so how is that idolatry? How does that work? Because, you know, we can, we can say, well, I probably shouldn't have done that, or I probably shouldn't have thought that, or I probably shouldn't have said that. But we don't really put it at a level that is as significant as what Paul puts it in here when he says, and this is idolatry. So how is it that you can call that idolatry? How is it that that you know, works out that way? Because of course idolatry is worshiping something that is not God. And anything that you worship that is not focused in Jesus Christ and God the Father and in the Holy Spirit is idolatry. And so what we're talking about here I think primarily is it's a focus. Um, you know, when you are focused on, uh, on on lust, for example, and and lust is a lust is a very heavy word. It, it doesn't mean um, uh, well. Let's apply it. Let's apply it to uh, worldly goods, for example, because lust isn't just about sexual stuff. So you see a Ferrari go by, and and so Jamie's revealing you know some of his issues. You see a Ferrari go by and you go, ooh, I'd like that. That's a nice looking car. Okay, and you can translate that in any any lustful direction you desire. That's that isn't that isn't lust. Lust in in the uh, in the Greek, the word for lust indicates hot pursuit. Okay, that's the way a professor in seminary put it and I, I really like that terminology. It's not just saying, that's a nice looking car, you know. It's saying, I got to figure out how I can get that car, whatever it takes. And, uh, and, and so it isn't even necessarily lusting after something that someone else owns, but becoming so preoccupied with that issue and that item and that, uh, you know, that thing that it occupies our whole mind and occupies our, our life. And when something occupies our mind that isn't God, and we're focused on it, what what is that? It's idolatry. It, it's a focus on something that is not worthy of our focus. So idolatry is what it is. You know, there's there really is no escaping that. And and you can say, well, it's not idolatry like I'm worshiping in front of an idol or something. You know, for crying out loud. Well, yeah, actually, it, it is. And, uh, and these are things that are really critical for us. 
Um, when when we get nailed by God, don't discount it down to it's no big deal, you know. Because one of the things that happens, you know, he goes on and uh, and then he says, uh, um, you know, he talks about us essentially being accountable. Admonish one another as you teach and admonish one another. We are responsible for each other, with each other, and to each other. And, and so, um, you know, these are things that we we do need to be working on together. Do you see your fellow Christians as allies in the war against your old self? to become your new self in Christ, which is your true self. Because without that, you're never going to be who you really are. You're going to be some image that you have created or that has been created for you, which is not of God and doesn't reflect God. Again, what is, what's that? Well, it says, you know, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That focus is within us, and it flows from us, that relationship with Jesus. Anything that gets in the way of that is, is a problem. And anything that gets in the way of that is, by definition, idolatry. So don't discount some of the things that are going on in your life that God is sort of tapping you on the shoulder on. Now, that doesn't mean you beat yourself up and, and you uh, say, oh, there's no hope for me. I'm such an abject, total sinner. Well, yeah, you are. Okay, and I am too. I absolutely am too. However, God is working on us. So if he brings up something in you like that, don't discount it. Don't write it off and say, well, I can't really do anything about that. You know, um, which is what we're prone to do. Uh, maybe it's just me, you know. Um, but you don't want to do that. You want to be growing in Christ until you stand before Christ. And uh, and so, you know, you, you have all these things and you know, you know you shouldn't be doing it. You know you shouldn't be thinking it. You know you shouldn't be living it out. And uh and and you know it goes on, do not lie to each other. Why? Because you've taken off your old self. You don't have to do it anymore. God has removed that absolute necessity from you to continue in sin with no hope and has replaced it with a newness of life which has with it, in it, and through it absolute hope. And, and he goes on, he says, you know, there, it, it's not the same. You are not the same person. There is no Greek or Jew. There is no circumcised or uncircumcised person. There is no barbarian. There is no Scythian. There's no nobody who is a slave and nobody who's free. Even if you're still a slave, because remember at this point, um, you know Paul is teaching slaves to be good slaves. It's not like he's saying you don't have to be a slave anymore. You can run away. You can do this. What does he do with uh, Onesimus in the book of Philemon, which I encouraged you to read just recently? He uh, he sends him back to his owner. He says you go back and and you be a good slave. You know, reflect Christ in your servanthood. Um, but he also he also writes to Philemon. Now, you know, don't forget. He also writes to Philemon and says, um, everything that Onesimus did for me, I'm applying to your account. So as far as I'm concerned, you sent him here to help me when no one else could help me. Uh, and, and so, you know, here's Paul encouraging Philemon, and it would appear that indeed Philemon paid attention to that and actually set Onesimus free as a slave because Philemon was a Christian. But when you live in a world where slavery is the norm, um, you know, it, it's, an, uh, it's an unthought process. But if we are changed people, don't we begin to think differently? And it appears that Onesimus was set free because, in point of fact, it appears he is one of the first bishops of the church. So, you know, changed people, changed people. You know, you, you don't, he says to Onesimus, you don't change your circumstances. That's not up to you. You go and be faithful to God, whatever it is that you're doing. And, uh, and in the end, we see, um, you know, his, his master changes from Philemon to the Lord completely. And, uh, and so, 
you know, these are the things that can happen in the life of a Christian. And, and to expect less and to satisfy your soul with less is idolatry. So that's good enough, you know. I, I don't want to get too good. You know, nobody's going to like me if I get too good. And uh, I, I don't think most of us really are at any great risk of that in this life, okay? However, we, that's, you know, we want to be striving to be exactly who we are in relationship to Christ. And uh, everything else becomes secondary to that, or is supposed to. So he goes on and he talks about, uh, um, you know, and this is where you start out with this negative. You know, cut out this crap in your life. Cut it out. Don't you see what it is? And then he goes, therefore, as God's chosen people, and he doesn't say, if you become God's chosen people, he doesn't say, if you were God's chosen people, he doesn't put, throw an if in there. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, which is what they were, even in the midst of not being perfect yet, they were still God's chosen people. He wasn't just talking about the Jews because he just got done saying there is no Jew and, and Greek. Okay, And we know that he's talking to the church at Colossae, and, and the church at Colossae was primarily made up of Gentiles. Okay? So all of a sudden, being you are God's chosen people. And I'm saying to you today, you are God's chosen people. And, uh, and since you are God's chosen people, holy, maybe not as holy as you need to be, maybe not as holy as you're going to be tomorrow, hopefully, uh, not as holy for sure as you're going to be before you stand before God, but you are now even holy and dearly loved he says, this is what you want to be doing. Clothe yourself. That means what everyone else can see about you coming out of you. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What wonderful, wonderful things those are. Bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. We talked about that earlier this week. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So what we're striving for is perfect love. And the only way we're going to have perfect love is if we get the love straightened out between us and God first. And then, as that is being perfected in us, it's going to flow out of us. I've always been of the opinion that... Um, and, and being a guy, okay, um, I'll, use, I'll use the words that would, you know, come out of me. There are gorgeous people, and that can be either gender for sure, you know. Guys just don't really necessarily recognize other guys that are gorgeous. That's the truth. I've, had, I've been, had lots of friends who were girls, you know, all my life. And, uh, and they would say something about somebody, and, and I remember another friend and I, uh, a guy named Jeff Nash um, was in my wedding. Great guy, wonderful guy, and we would look at each other and go, "It must be hope for me," you know, because <laughs> sometimes you just really can't get it. But okay, so there's gorgeous people, and that's one thing. You look at them and you know, okay, that they're gorgeous. Then there's beautiful people, and beauty, you know, gorgeous is on the outside. There were lots of studies done. It's, you know, balance between, you know, now if you look, here's, here's uh, you know, earlobe, earlobe, and can you see the difference? My, my, my face is a little lopsided. I don't know if my mother dropped me on my head when I was young or not. I doubt it, but I think it just is the nature of things. So, you know, there's certain things that make you gorgeous on the outside. But beauty comes out of the inside. And, and you know what's really interesting is that beauty makes people gorgeous. But gorgeous does not make beauty. You can see someone that really is like, that's a strikingly attractive individual. And, uh, and then as you get to know them better, you realize there is nothing of substance in that person that you would want to emulate or that would cause you to desire to hang out with them, be with them. Um, Whereas someone who is beautiful, 
that beauty emanates and, and they become much more attractive to be with, to engage with. And, and that's, that's not, you know, that, that has nothing to do with gender. That has to do with what's on the inside of a human being. And the thing that I have seen is that the, the more that God gets a hold of people, the more beauty pours out of them. And, uh, and that is a, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that's what he's talking about here, you know. Um, over all these virtues, put on love. Clothe yourself with compassion. It's like, what do you see when you see a person? Initially, all you see is this. But as time goes by and you get to know them, the thing that you see when you see them is what you know about them. And, and you don't worry about whether they're wearing a Hawaiian shirt, even though it's Hawaiian shirt weather, you know. Or whether they got a haircut or not, even if they needed one desperately. You, you don't, those are not the thoughts that come. The thoughts that come to your mind as soon as you see them have to do with being and have to do with beauty. That which flows from the inside out. God changes the inside. And, uh, and idolatry only changes the outside and it doesn't change it for the better so as you think about those things you know ask ask God where is it that you need to uh, relinquish some idolatry and where is it that you need to let go of some things or maybe even some people what is it that God is calling you to do and uh, and you know we, we've been in a forced hiatus from the world um, it, it is no mistake that this passage comes now into our lives because we've been separated from other people and the focus of idolatries often is in other people and uh, if you have a chance in your life to really break free from some of the garbage that's been controlling you in your life this has been the time culminating into this moment right now. And God undoubtedly is going to be speaking to your hearts about this very subject. And uh, and you need to pay attention to it. You need to pay attention to it. Because he's not going to just leave you here. He's going to pick you up and carry you and take you where you need to be. Showing you some new stuff. This is These are good days, folks. Hard days but they're really good days. So rejoice in that. And, uh, you know, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Amen. Now, I said I was going to kind of finish up with some announcements, and, and uh, I do want to uh, do that. Tomorrow, we will be having communion. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be online. Again, it's going to come at the end of the service, so if you can't, in good conscience, within yourself, you know, acclimate yourself to that idea, then you don't have to. You stay till the end of the of the the message and the uh, final hymn and the benediction, and and you don't have to stay on and do communion. But if you would like to, you'll need some bread and some grape juice, and I would invite you with all my heart to come and share in the uh, in in the meal that God prepared for us from before the foundation of the world, and be strengthened and encouraged and blessed. So. Grab on to that. I, I just, I really encourage you. I am doing it in good conscience. I really believe this is this is appropriate. And uh, and so um, we're going to do that tomorrow. And we're going to keep on doing that until we can get together again. Uh, some people are really lifting up a lot of questions about, wow, so what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to get together again? When are we going to be able to get started? Now, Trump said this, and the governor said that, and what are we going to do? Well, um, we are a denomination. In the United Methodist Church, we do have a hierarchy of as you know as such, and we do have a bishop and we do have a cabinet in our annual conference, and there are other uh, you know uh, the council of bishops and all kinds of stuff. So we have a hierarchy of order, and and quite frankly, um, that's more important to me by far. Not just because I'm afraid of getting fired or something like that, okay? Um, but because 
I bought into a system as a United Methodist which said there are people who have authority over me. So I am going to be listening to them. I'm going to act on what is coming down from the authority within the church. And I'm much more worried about that than I am from the authority on the outside of the church, whether president or governor or anybody else. Okay. And, and so we will keep you posted and we will be getting together again as, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, if there is a way of doing something right now, um, you know, 10 people, that includes a pastor, by the way, I, I believe. Um, I'm not sure how we do that well. Um, I just read this morning about one church who is setting up a schedule so that people can come and uh, uh, at 10 at a time. And uh, I, I don't know that that's something that um, I, uh, I'm, I'm ready to do at this point. Uh, if things get along far enough, then maybe we will. Um, I'm certainly open for some possibilities. But as I said, right now I have an authority over me. Um, and that's honestly one of the reasons why I'm a United Methodist. I appreciate the fact that I am not the authority. Um, and uh, I think it's dangerous when we get too big for our bridges. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, I will absolutely keep you posted every day about where we're at, okay? I promise you that. And uh, we are going to get back together again. We don't know when. But in the meantime, we are together here. We are the body of Christ. And we have said consistently for years that this is fine. We can do this. Because we are spiritually connected. And the, and the spiritual connection that we have is much more powerful than the physical connection of saying hi, hugging, those sorts of things. And we've said that for years. The proof of the pudding is being done right now. And we are real and we are the church and we will continue to be the church. Praise God. He's the one who's ultimately in charge. Okay? Listen, you have a great day today. Uh, relax or get a lot done, whatever it is that you know is, is on your plate for this day. Know that God will be walking with you in it, working with you through it, and uh, and listen, listen for what He has to say to you. Amen. Have a great day.